One of the worst things as a guy on YouTube is having to deal with meeting some of your subscribers when you go out. One of the reasons we gave up on Nomadic Life was we kept meeting people out on the road. You know, we go to a campground and, hey, you're on YouTube, and all of a sudden you're best friends, and you, you just had to pretend like you, you knew them forever. What I don't think folks realize, or they can't comprehend, or some folks, I shouldn't say all folks, but some folks can't comprehend is, I'm talking to a camera right now. I don't know who you are, never met you in my life. Now, I know that some people feel like they've developed a relationship with me through watching years of my videos, and I appreciate that. But when you meet me, I, I don't know you. I don't know if you're dangerous. or One of the things that happens to me a lot is emails. Now, there are a lot of emails that are very polite, and then there's the emails that are just as rude as possibly can be. And so anytime my email messengers go off and I don't recognize the name and the notification on my phone, my, my, my stomach drops. Oh, here we go with another cussing out. Now they say that you're supposed to get used to this over time, that as a YouTuber, uh, it just rolls off your back, but it doesn't. I mean, there's too many YouTubers out there. As a matter of fact, YouTube has tried to have addressed this issue. Many YouTube experts address this issue a lot. I've made it into a game where I, I just kind of pick back at the trolls. But now, like I said, there's a lot of people that send really nice emails, and I appreciate those. But as you know, I've recently upgraded or made more efficient my solar panel system. When we first got here, we were in a hurry to get a bunch of things done all at once. When we first got here, the first day we had to get the camper off the truck so we had some place to live. And I had to put a base on the bottom of the ca truck camper. So I had a floor. Well, I twisted my ankle the night before, so that made it even worse. It was just a lot to do. And then the second day, we had to get the well going so we had water. Because I only brought, I don't know, four buckets of water or something. So I had to get water going. Had to get that clean. So there's two days wasted. Well, on the third day, I finally started setting up the solar panels. Although we just stopped being nomads and we were running the generator as nomads about eight hours a day, we run it in the four hours in the morning, charge the battery, and four hours in the evening, charging the battery. But while we were here, we had a lot of tools to run, we had the well pump to run, we just had a lot of things that we had to run. So I just left it run 24 hours. And, and I didn't even worry about the battery. I didn't want to have that on my plate also with all the things to do. So I third day I set up the solar panels well I didn't have a lot of equipment so I had some 18 gauge wire and I had some 12 gauge wire and I did the best I could to hook it up with what I had well as time progressed I just kind of started ignoring the solar panels I really didn't pay much attention to them anymore and I started building a tiny house and, and then the next year we started working on the chickens and well finally this year Carolyn's son wanted to stay with us for a while so we bought that camper and he needed more electric than what we could provide with what I had done so I started really focusing in on what I needed to do with the solar panels so it was kind of a good thing he came just to help me out so I can understand things so I started watching the charge controller and trying to understand what it was doing so when he was running the air conditioner for example I noticed that even though I had 50 amps of solar panels available the charge controller was only letting 25 go through and when the batteries were really drained down it would sometimes get up into the 30 amp range through but what ended up occurring to me is the charge controller was assuming I had one 100 amp battery and so you're only allowed to charge the battery to 25 percent of its max capacity so at a hundred amp hour battery you're only allowed to charge 25 amps an hour. Well, I've got 800 amp hours of batteries. I got eight 100 amp hour batteries. I can put more amps into it. So what I did was I ended up getting a second charge controller. So now I have two 25 amp hour charge controllers going into the battery, which gives me the 50. As a matter of fact, I actually have 60 amps of solar panels now because I bought two more. And I've actually seen it get up to 58 amps, even though I know some of the solar panels are not working very well. But I kind of digress with that a little bit. I've really went into a lot of exp explanation 
into how to set up solar panels and I've gotten a lot of feedback on this positive and negative more so on the positive side people are very appreciative that I've used my stupid brain and kind of dumbed down the information because that's the only way I know how to talk is is the way I'm talking and people are saying thanks for dumbing it down for me now that's not me saying it I'm not saying this is for coming from the comment section there are a lot of youtubers out there who talk about solar panels but it's way up here just way above your head and you got to rewatch it and you got to Google things I mean I just watched one the other day and he was he just he was talking gibberish and I know he was talking about a battery but it, it was just gibberish well with my system there, there's not much gibberish involved there's batteries and a charge controller and an inverter and solar panels and I have broken all those down I've showed you the individual components I've explained what each individual component can do so you need four components when I say battery I don't go life pro any guy good and bad I don't do any of that it's lead acid batteries you buy from Walmart well there is a downside to having lead acid batteries you have to be on top of them you have to always be taking care of them whereas the lithium ion phosphate thousand dollar battle born batteries are supposed to be far superior well I'm just not gonna spend a thousand dollars on a battery I'm not even convinced it's that much superior but if you have them great I'm not criticizing them I just enjoy my lead acid batteries they're easy to fix they're easy to replace not a lot of headache but there are a couple things I have to do every day to make sure that they give me a long life one of the things I got to do is I got to get the charge up on the batteries up to 13.6 volts every day I got to get it that high now in order for me to get a fully charged battery I got to get up to 14.4 volts and then the charge controller will go from 50 amps and it will slowly go down in amperage as the voltage goes up so as you get up to 14.4 volts eventually you're gonna get down to zero amps charging well when you get to 13.6 you're kind of right here in the middle and you got to do that every day even in your car battery you're supposed to do that otherwise you start to shorten the life of the battery so I just always make sure that I get my batteries fully charged every day 14.4 volts 0 amps even though I'm only needing 13.6 I get it up to 14.4 and the reason is is because I'm got to run that freezer and I just got to get it through the night every night because what I don't want to happen is the second thing that can go wrong with your batteries and that is you get it below 50% blood acid batteries I tell you I have a hundred amp hour battery but I really don't Walmart says I have a hundred amp amp hour battery but I don't I have a 50 amp hour battery I only have 50 amp hours that are usable if you get below 12.3 volts which is 50 percent of the battery life then you're gonna damage the battery so two things can happen on one day let's say it's a cloudy day like it is today and I don't get the charge up past 13.6 volts and then I run my freezer all night and uh, the charge gets below 12.3 volts so now I've double damaged my battery I'm going to shorten the life of the lead acid battery that is just the downside of owning lead acid and I understand that people are going to argue about the lithium ion phosphates but that's not what this video is about people will tell me I've made a mistake that I should have lithium ion but to be honest the only person that can tell me that I've made a mistake is me and I'm quite satisfied with my lead acid batteries there's just a ton of reasons I've explained them all before but that's what I got to do now somebody asked me the other day in the con no I guess it was an email what do I need to do so I don't have to run the generator anymore and the answer would be well I guess twofold to be honest go to lithium ion batteries and have enough batteries to last you throughout the cloudy period the problem is you could be cloudy for two days or you could be cloudy for 10 days here in Missouri and in the winter time it actually gets worse now that's another separate issue is in the winter time all batteries lithium ion lead acid it doesn't matter become less efficient when you try to start your car in the winter time you brand new battery and it will struggle to start it just doesn't have as many amps because it's cold it's just all batteries are like that lithium-ion if you don't believe me 
grab your cell phone when it's zero degrees outside, come outside, let that battery get cold for 10 minutes and your phone will die. So bo both batteries, lead acid and lithium will have a problem. Now the problem with lithium ion batteries is when it freezes, gets below 50 degrees, you can't even charge it, it says so in the instructions. Now I know people will say, well they're heated. You don't have to worry about that, they're heated. But that takes electricity that I don't have. So I don't want to use extra electricity to maintain the warmth of my battery when I can just use lead acid. The answer to the question is what do I got to do to get away from generator use is just get a ton more batteries. The problem with that is, is in the end it's less cost effective. I honestly believe, even though you got to buy gasoline, I understand the argument. I believe in the end it's going to be more costly to get a bigger battery bank than it would be just to run the generator a few hours a day on the rare occasion that you have to charge the batteries. Since I've done the upgrades to the solar panels, I haven't had to charge the batteries that much. I don't even think I've actually ran it from 12.3 to fully charged. I don't think I've done that. It usually takes about four hours since I've upgraded. Because every day I've noticed, every day, since I've upgraded the solar panels, sun has come out for enough time to charge the batteries. That's all you need. The other thing is, is if you want to do that, you're going to have to get the lithium ion battery because you still have to get your battery up to 13.6 volts. Even if you had a huge battery bank, you would have to do that. Now, some people said wired to 48 volts and all that, and that, that's a whole different subject, but you could do that as well. Then I had another question. I was asked, why do I fill the Carolyn sinks for her laundry? with the well. Why don't I let her fill the sinks with the RV pump? So just to recap what I have, I have a well, deep well that I run off the solar panels, but I struggle to run it on cloudy days like this. So on a mildly sunny day, I can run the well for about 15 minutes. So I fill the IBC tank up every day that it's not too cloudy. Well, I also use the well on sunny days to fill the sinks and then I just leave them there. I cover them up and when she's ready to do laundry, she's always got water available. So I was asked, why don't I run the hose from the IBC tank to the sinks? And when she wants to have water in her sinks, she could just fill it. Well, we kind of already did that. When Carolyn's son moved in, we had to get water down to him. So we just ran, you can get those splitters, you can get it for your water faucet, your spigot outside where water goes in and can go out to one side and the other side and it gives you two hoses that you can run. That's what I hooked up. I hooked it up to the RV pump. So my IBC tank has 275 gallons in it and one hose runs into our house and one hose runs into the RV. I could do that. I could run a separate hose over here. It wouldn't be that difficult. And Carol and I have discussed it. If she starts to run water on a cloudy day, because I said this the other day, she wants to run water on a cloudy day and she uses too much water. I guess it's just my personality. Then I won't be able to fill the, the IBC tank. And I know that's not a big deal. We got 275 gallons and she used, let's say 50. The problem I run into is if anything ever happened to our system, and I think there's a lot of potential that things could go wrong. That's why I have so many backup systems. So let's say the well pump, didn't work and I couldn't fill the IBC tank for a week or two. Well she just used 50 gallons and now I gotta last several weeks without a well pump. We may not make it on water. So I always like trying to keep the water topped off in case something goes wrong or the solar panels don't work. I, we were cloudy for several days and we use a lot of water. Now, another idea, and I know where this comes from, there's a huge YouTuber that collects rainwater. And I'm, that's great. If you wanna collect rainwater, by all means do it. I don't wanna collect rainwater. I've done it before. When we were nomads, we were in the North Rim, Grand Canyon, in the National Forest, not the state park. So very secluded, miles away from anybody. So we started collecting rainwater off the camper. The water was just filthy dirty. If you look at your metal roof like we have, I clean my metal roof every spring. And by fall time, it is just caked with 
bird droppings and sap and dirt and just everything you can imagine has fallen on that roof if i did a rain collection to put it in carolyn's sink she's going to look at it and say that's dirty water why, you know, why am i washing clothes in dirty water if you could filter that water then fine i'm okay with that but it, the, it would clog the filters relatively quickly i know i've done it before when we were in the north room now i know i use filters on my well but that's as a precautionary token in case my well gets dirty i don't contaminate my ibc tank with dirty water but if i have to replace those filters every month or every couple of weeks because i'm using rainwater that becomes pretty expensive pretty quick so these are the questions some of the subscribers have asked me and i wanted to get those cleared up let's click this up next box to take the video that i made yesterday so if i can inspire you to really think through your processes so you can live your dreams thanks for watching